you are. Jannah has no night or day. It is always light, but not a lightness like the bright sun. It is a light coming from under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jannah has in it eternal spouses for every single person who enters it. Al-Hur al-Ain, eternal spouses. The Hur, the Hur are those creations of Allah that words cannot describe their beauty. Words cannot do justice to how radiant and how glorious they are. And shall be blessed with more than one partner in Jannah. There shall be no person who remains single in Jannah. There shall be no person, even if a person was not married in this life, Allah Azza wa Jal will create for him or even her a partner in Jannah. No person shall remain single in Jannah. Jannah has the choiciest of foods, the freshest of meats, the juiciest of fruits. Whatever a person desires shall be presented to him instantaneously. Most of the things of Jannah will be similar to this world in look, but not in taste or feel. So the fruits will be the fruits. There shall have apples and pears and mangoes. There shall be things that we know. But when we taste it, when we feel it, it will be different. Allah says, وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهَا They have been given something which looks the same, but it is not the same. And there are things in Jannah which have not been described. Why? Because we will not be able to understand them. There are things in Jannah that have been created for the people of Jannah that we don't know about. We have no idea what they are. The Prophet ﷺ told us, in Jannah are things that eyes have never seen, ears have never heard, and minds have never conceived. We have not even thought of these pleasures. We cannot think of them. Our minds are limited to think of them. Hence, because we cannot understand them, Allah has not told us about them, but they are waiting for us prepared in Jannah as we speak. These are some of the descriptions of Jannah. And the greatest blessing of Jannah, the greatest blessing of Jannah, a blessing that outshadows all of the other blessings, that eclipses each and every blessing of Jannah. The greatest blessing of Jannah is the blessing of looking at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. On that day, faces will be bright and shining. Shining bright, why? Because they will be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would say, Allahumma inni as'aluka lalzatan nadari ila wajhika al-kareem. Oh Allah, I ask you the sweetness, lalza. He calls it ladil, sweetness. I ask you the sweetness for looking at your noble face. This is the greatest blessing of Jannah. And this blessing is so great that whoever is blessed with it, whenever they are blessed with it, they shall forget about all of Jannah that has to offer them. They shall forget even about Jannah because this is a blessing that is greater than Jannah itself. Now, brothers and sisters, the Jannah that I have described for you, the Jannah that the Quran describes, Jannah of beautiful gardens and rivers and palaces and streams and of eternal spouses beautiful women given in Jannah and of recliners of silk and brocade. This Jannah in our times is not politically correct. When we tell non-Muslims about this Jannah, many of them, they ridicule it. They say, look at your religion. That the ultimate goal of your religion is to live in a place where there's women and wine, where there's palaces and brocade where there's silk and fine clothes and meat. What type of religion is this? And they make fun of Islam, some of them. And they are sarcastic about our religion. What type of Jannah is this? We now are a refined culture. We are a civilization that values intellect, that values intellectual pursuits. We are not concerned with these bodily animal characteristics and functions. Yet, 
My dear brothers and sisters, the irony of all ironies, this very human being, if you were to ask him at another occasion, not in this conversation, take him aside and have a general conversation with him, and ask him to bring up his fondest memories of this life, what was his best moments? Or ask him, when he has some spare time and spare money, how will he spend that money? What will he do? What will be his response? He will tell you, I will call up my girlfriend or my wife and spouse. We will go for a romantic stroll on the beach. We will go to a beautiful park or garden. Then we will go to a fancy restaurant with beautiful ambience and surroundings where we will have a very good and expensive meal and wine. And we will sit there and eat the best of all foods and meats. And then we will go home and if he is lucky, he will be intimate with this spouse or girlfriend. And this will be his greatest evening. His evening of joy and luxury. This evening will go down in his memory and he will boast about it to his friends later on that I did this and I did that. And this is exactly a Jannah on earth for him. And our Jannah gives similar descriptions in a much more beautiful manner. The point being, this man, even though he might make fun of Jannah, in his own life, his actions speak louder than words. And when he wants a taste of joy, a taste of Jannah, he does exactly what he ridicules us that our Jannah describes. Exactly, letter to letter, word for word. Why? Because my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal created us and He knows what we like. He knows what we need to live. He knows what our desires are interested in. And that is why we cannot escape our animal desires. They are halal. We have to channel them to halal. We cannot escape them. And so Allah tempts us with that which we know we will be tempted by. Allah tells us those incentives that will make us want and strive to enter this Jannah. There is nothing embarrassing about the descriptions of Jannah. No, rather, Jannah is exactly like each and every one of, one of us wants it to be like. That is something we want to be in. We want to strive to be therein. And even if somebody makes fun of it with his tongue, in his heart of hearts, in his daily life, in his actions, he will prove himself wrong. That that is exactly what he wants as well. Now the concept of Jannah is something that exists primarily in the three, as they call it, Abrahamic faiths, meaning the three religions that respect the Prophet Ibrahim salam, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Jews and Christians also believe in some type of paradise, but the type of paradise they believe in is very different than the type we believe in. We don't have time to get into those details, but they have some concept of paradise. And also many of the modern uh, Jews don't even believe in a paradise, but the classical Jews, they did believe in them. But uh, the modern Jews, most of them, they don't believe in an actual paradise in the hereafter. Other religions as well have some concept, but not like our paradise. Hinduism and Buddhism. The ultimate goal of Hinduism is moksha. And the ultimate goal of Buddhism is nirvana. These goals, it is not a jannah. It is not something that is a physical entity. Rather, it is an intellectual concept. It is a theoretical, abstract reality. Both are very similar. These concepts, they signify the end of the infinite cycle of life and death. Because these religions, they are called the dharmic religions. They believe in dharma, they believe in karma that a person will be resurrected over and over again based upon the actions that he has done in one life, he shall suffer in the next life. Until finally a state is reached. For the Hindus it must exist of the elite of the Brahmins and of the, of the, of the Buddhists, anybody can strive to achieve Nirvana. When they achieve this state, they cease to be resurrected over and over again. They break away from the cycle, infinite cycle of life. And to them, this is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to break away from life. In other words, the ultimate goal of life is to break away from life and become something non-existent. No doubt these goals inspire some people. And it is because of this that we find many Westerners converting to Buddhism and Hinduism. They're interested in these things. 
But the reality is for most people, these goals are abstract. These goals are not tangible. And that is why the reversion to Islam is much, much more. People convert to Islam millions and millions because there is a more realistic motivational factor. And of course, because of the theology and other things as well. So the Islamic goal of Jannah is a goal that really and truly inspires each and every human being to want to be there. It is a goal that is understandable and imaginable. It is a goal that is realistic. It is a goal that appeals to us as human beings. And it is a goal that as it exists is unique to the religion of Islam. No other religion believes in the concept of Jannah as we do. It must be said, however, that Jannah, even though it is one of our primary goals, it is not the ultimate and the only goal for which we worship Allah.